Dobrý večer. Já mám tu čas. Good evening. It's a great pleasure to introduce to you Matian tonight. And I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Kamila Hladíková and I'm a sinologist. And here at the festival I was I have been interpreting for Matien. And the reason for that is that a few years ago I translated a few of his earlier stories and that's when we actually met. So today I have the honor of hosting his reading. Ask uh, a few questions and uh, because he is afraid of speaking English in public. We are going to speak Chinese and I'll be also an interpreter. So please bear with me because you're basically going to have to um, listen to a bit of Chinese. I'll interpret it into Czech and then from that Czech it'll be interpreted into English. So it's going to be perhaps a little slower. So let me start with the first question. And that question goes back to the 1980s. The 1980s in China were a time of opening to the world. Up until 1989, many people believed that the Chinese totalitarian regime was going to loosen up eventually and change. But Ma Tian left China before 1989 before the Tiananmen Square massacre. So my first question to him is why he left during the 1980s, what were his reasons, and what are his memories of the 1980s? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight, and it's a very pleasant surprise that so many of you have turned up, that so many of you are interested in literature. Although the Czech Republic is a small country, it is certainly a great country as far as literature is concerned. I've come to Prague several times. Uh, during my first trip, I came with the first wife uh, a few years ago. That was the first time that I got acquainted with Prague. In fact, 13 years. And my second trip to Prague was at a time when my wife was uh, working here. She worked for a Chinese actor, Kony, interpreting for her. And I was here basically babysitting. While my wife worked, I was taking care of our two kids. During those two months, when I was babysitting here, I've managed to walk through um, all the streets of uh, Prague's old town. And I was always wondering, why is it that despite communism and uh, despite all the changes that took place here in the late 80s and early 90s, Prague was able to keep its calm and yet very impressive spirit.
Perhaps you're going to be surprised to hear uh, that Franz Kafka's cemetery, or the cemetery where Franz Kafka's grave is, is my favorite place in Prague. And what I was quite impressed by is that right across uh, the lane from the grave of uh, Franz Kafka um, is the grave of Max Brod, his publisher. Now to go back to your question, China in the 1980s. Well, in the 1980s, China went through something similar that the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia went through in the 1960s. In the 60s, and perhaps even later, Underground or Samizdat literature was published in Prague, or if not published, at least accessible. And uh, this is something that came to China in the 1980s. So 1980s were a time when it was possible to publish many books on various issues, opening a real debate. And I guess the strongest impression that I still have from the 1980s was that in the 80s, the totality of the Communist Party started watering down. So in the 80s, we were able to get to know Czech literature. So for, for instance, I read Karel Čapek. Back in the 80s, we didn't really know what the West was like, what kind of life people led. The only thing we knew that was, uh, was that uh, the West was free. And we hoped that the reforms that were opening China up to the world would deepen and that the regime would become more and more liberal. But the reform process, the opening up to the world, was very slow and in fact was interrupted in the 1980s by two political campaigns. And these political campaigns changed my life. I was interrogated by the police. I was put in jail and when I woke up in the morning in the jail cell, I have to say that something shook me up profoundly. There was a hole in the wall and uh, a stream of light entered my cell through that hole and uh, a breeze did too. And in that ray of light, I noticed that there was a lot of inscriptions on the wall and that people wrote those inscriptions by their own blood. And a lot of these inscriptions were no longer legible, but some of them still were. Often reactionary uh, slogans such as down with the Communist Party or cuss words and saying, you know, when I leave here, I'm going to dot, 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 dot your mother.
I was a painter at the time. I had written a few poems and perhaps uh, even a story, but I wasn't happy with my writing. And when I was looking at the wall with blood inscriptions, I concluded that I was not going to paint anymore. And I realized that all those people writing on the wall have uh, fates, vicissitudes that simply cannot be left neglected. But this brings me slowly in answering your question to why I left China before 1989, why I left and settled in Hong Kong. Well, it was this sort of experiences. And in fact, there was one scene that is seared in my memory. After I was arrested and interrogated, one of the cops told me that if I don't do the right thing, he would make sure that I disappear without a trace. So it was fear, in fact, that forced me to flee. I knew that I'd be able to live in China, to write, to keep part of my personal integrity or even part of my work. But there was this fear and a guilty conscience, because if you live in a totalitarian country, you can never be uh, completely honest. So, so much about the, so much about the 1980s. Okay, my next question. Ma Qing published last year another novel called The Beijing Coma. So my next question is, what is this novel about and why you wrote it? Uh, Beijing Coma, uh, Beijing Zhiwuren, 就是我其实在这之前我写了一个那个叫那个The New Domake 也是一个政治预言小说 Well, there are more reasons why I wrote this political novel The fact is that I had been writing other novels such as The New Domake uh, which was also very political. The画面，这个画面就是有一个裸体的男人躺在一个床上，然后有一只鸟飞来了，这个鸟就把这个人的肉体当成了一个窝，因为这个人还有温度。后来这个鸟慢慢的把自己的羽毛全都磨掉了，
，我要探讨了一个哲学主题，就是崇高。崇高，我不知道能不能翻译。跟那个那个昆德有什么关系？昆德拉要写了个书叫《不朽》，就是人死了以后还会被人纪念，叫《不朽》。那么我就想写一个另一种东西，就是崇高。在活着的期间，你要感受到一种生命的生命的崇高。I was also inspired by the work of the Czech or sorry French author Milan Kundera, who wrote a famous novel, which talks about treating human bodies after death. And I wanted to write something about a person who uh, has not died yet, but stopped living and could not do anything else. In this book, I will be able to be a sacrifice. A sacrifice. A sacrifice. A sacrifice. That bird appearing in the novel. Uh, then became the harbinger of death. Takže velmi jednoduše se dá říct, že ten román Pekingské koma je román o tom táčkovi. You might say that the Beijing coma is a novel about that bird. And the political aspect of the novel is that it tells a story of a student uh, who had been protesting at Tiananmen Square, had been shot and seriously wounded and was in coma for 10 years. And then when he wakes up from the coma, he realizes that all the rest of the people are not living anymore. They were just vegetating and only then when he woke up from his coma he actually faced real death real peril and doom as a matter of coincidence Shortly before the Tiananmen massacre on the 20th of January 1989, I left Beijing. I left the protesters to went to my hometown of Tinto uh, because my brother then was wounded and ended up in a coma. And I only got the news of the massacre at Tiananmen Square um, when I was uh, sitting by the bedside of my brother. I saw um, the news program I watched foreign TV channels like the BBC to get more information about the massacre. And in fact, after the Tiananmen Square massacre, the horrors did not stop. Unfortunately, it continued because after that one day of massacre, people kept being arrested. People were getting wounded later on as well. People were being arrested by the police and that went on. It was really the start of the horrors, the Tiananmen Square massacre.
And then, then I started seeing my brother as a victim because my brother became someone who given up the possibility to live a physical life in order to serve as a living memory of the massacre at Tiananmen Square. Well, we'll have a look at my next question. The question is still about the novel. I would like to know more about your perception of the symbol of a person in coma. How did it come to your mind to write about a hero, a character who is in a coma? What kind of a metaphor is it? Okay,那么关于植物人的问题是这样，呃，如果你们在座的去过中国，你们会发现现代的中国跟过去的中国呃是变化非常大的。嗯，Those uh, of you who have been to China or who can travel to China will have realized that our country has been changing. Um, and the change is really vast in all the areas of life. After all the events following the Tiananmen Square massacre back in 1989, uh, the dominating trend in China was a huge economic boom. And as a result of that, um, everything in China was dominated by greed in the 90s, so everybody was focusing on making money. Everybody, including intellectuals, became businessmen. People started writing just for the money, and all ideals in China seemed to have evaporated at that time. 经济的赚钱的，但是另一只手关于思想的，关于记忆的，它基本上是没有动。你就感觉到每个人都在变形。嗯，你是不是说？And whenever I meet my friends who are also writers, I always realize that their right hand, which is aimed at Men making money, it seemed to be so developed, so their abilities to make profits is well used, very actively used. However, the other hand, the left hand, which stands as a symbol of thinking, uh, seems underdeveloped, as if those people were not thinking at all. We also looked at one more issue. The festival has been looking at uh, the issue of writers in exile. I believe that um, a writer who has gone to exile has as his utmost task and challenge to maintain the memory of his or her nation because otherwise the memory would have disappeared and therefore I believe it is an important role that exiled writers uh, should play and that is 
to uh, restore um, the memory of the nation, the history of the nation, which a lot of people are tr trying to suppress. And therefore, I believe that it is the writers in exile who should take on that task. Um, because uh, those writers still living in China can no longer restore uh, and maintain the memory of the nation. Well, uh, Mr. Martin is suggesting that we should get down to reading now, and if there is any time left, we uh, will continue in the questions later on. Uh, this part, 呃,要不要先去聽呢,就是說明什麼呢,就是說明 before starting to read, I should perhaps uh, introduce the excerpt or perhaps the novel because we'll be just reading a very short text and it is important to give you some background on that. So, the piece we'll be reading is the ending of the novel. Uh, the way I've treated the novel is as uh, one opera or one piece of music, and we'll be looking at the climax scene where the meaning of the novel lies. Oh, and in that concluding scene, this person who had been in coma for 10 years following his injury after Tiananmen Square massacre, he's in the same uh, home where his mother had been looking after him, and suddenly that house was uh, is, is to be... Uh, pulled down and we see the bulldozers coming and the ex-student who had spent 10 years in coma then back on Tiananmen Square went to rally and went to sacrifice his life for those ideals and 10 years on having spent those 10 years in coma We witness a situation in which the house is to be demolished because uh, um, a block of offices is to be built there, and yet his uh, house would be brought down. And ten years ago, when that student went rallying uh, at Tiananmen Square, his mother was against that kind of protest. He, she did not want her son to protest against the regime. And 10 years on, when the bulldozers are coming to demolish the house, the mother decides that she would defend her own freedom suddenly. So she takes a Chinese flag in her hand and she's ready to give up her life uh, to protect the house which stands for her freedom. And since most of you cannot understand Chinese, I will read a, a, a short passage only and then there will be a reading of the Czech translation and that will be also read out in English later on. <sighs> 君子国还有一种植物叫熏花草,寿命极短,超生稀死。
，还向我们的队伍伸出了胜利的手势。唐国坚说：“这是武警，他们脱下制服抗命了。”小禅和大禅不知怎么找了个木棍子，把横幅挑了起来，使队伍有了一些气氛。但我疲惫不堪，连喊口号的力气都没有了。当走到一个门前挂着“坚决拥护党中央的英明领导”的束缚饭店时，吴斌从唐国先兜里拿出了打火机，冲上去就给点着了。几千人的队伍如流往旱地的水，越走越散。于静扛着迷迷的背包，咪咪和白灵手缠着手，小李赤着脚跟在陈迪的后面。带出广场的校旗也七零八落了。Now,、uh, just give the translators a second to locate the text because we seem to be having another piece of text in front of us. Hmm. Just give us one second. We'll try to find out what they are reading, and、uh, as soon as we find out, you'll hear the English. Produktoru zazněl hlas: Přič s fašismem, ať žije. Pak. All right, we got it. Sorry about that. Wang Fei switched on his black megaphone and shouted: "The people will be victorious. Down with fascism!" Tang Guoxiang waved our university flag in the air, and everybody shouted Wang Fei slogans, repeating them faster and faster. But as soon as the girls began shouting, they burst into tears. Bai Ling borrowed Wang Fei's megaphone and cried, "Don't look at the soldiers. They're trying to intimidate us. Ignore them." Her voice was hoarse. She was straining so hard to produce a noise. The tendons on her neck were bulging. Vava stopa po tankovem pasu. They seem to be reading an edited version, and we only have the entire story. So,、uh, you're just gonna have to bear with us. Byl se k němu. Kousek od mrtvého však uklouzl na břečce rozmačkaného masa a upadl. Na obličeji se mu rostřikl cákanec krve. Uchopil velkého čcha na zalevou ruku, která zůstala celá. Okay, we're just gonna read you what we have. <laughs> Teng Guoxian took off his shirt and tore it in two. Then pulled down Wang Fei's tattered jeans and tied the strips of shirt tightly around the bleeding thighs. Dong Rong flung off his jacket and draped it over Wang Fei's chest. Wang Fei had lost consciousness by now. We dragged him onto the pavement. His trembling mouth stiffened. A red light flashed from the walkie-talkie he was still gripping. A voice cried out through the speaker: "Down with fascism! Long live!" Then I spotted Chen Di. He was clutching the metal railing along the side of the road. His left foot crushed on a pulp to a pulp. The questions, the question marks on his T-shirt seemed to be screaming in anguish. Next to him, Xu Fa was lying motionless in a pool of blood. When Yu Jin and an old Fu pulled him up, they discovered he'd been hit by one of the bullets discharged by an armored personnel carrier. Blood was pouring from a wound in his back. Students hugged each other and wept. Mimi knelt on the road and howled with grief. Old Fu pulled off his red headband and used it to wipe his tears. Big Chan's body had been pulverized. It was now little more than a bloody tank track mark. A few white teeth lay on the ground where his head had been. When Little Chan caught sight of the body, he dropped the guitar he was holding and ran over. As he drew near, he slipped in a puddle of crushed flesh. And fell to the ground. Blood splattered onto his face. He picked up Big Chan's left hand, which was still intact, pulled off the cotton glove, and stared at the digital watch attached to the wrist. Tang Guoxian yelled, 
Someone help me live Wang Fei. I realized suddenly that we might be able to save Wang Fei. I helped Tang uh, Guo Xian li lift him onto a wooden hand cart. Then I grabbed the handles and we ran as fast as we could. Where's the nearest hospital? We shouted as we ran. Someone yelled back, go to Fuxing Hospital. Lots of injured have been taken there already. We kept running. I couldn't make out what the bright or dark objects were that flashed before me. My mind was numb. I felt as though I was wading through knee-deep water. When we reached the hospital entrance, I walked to the front of the cart to pull Wang Fei onto my back. But there was so much blood on the ground, I slipped and fell. Tang Guoxian and Wu Bin dragged Wang Fei into the entrance hall and screamed for help. The doctors who came forward looked as though he'd just crawled out of a river of blood. His gloves and face mask were bright red. Lie him flat on the stretcher and wait here, wait here, he shouted. There's no more room in the wards. The bulldozer charges into the building like an army tank, making our walls shake and our floor beams tremble and crack. It moves back, it tracks screeching over shattered glass and planks of wood. Beside it, a digger was shoveling broken tiles and metal frames into an open back truck. The bulldozer rams again and our walls shudder. Unable to take the strain any longer, our balcony suddenly gives way and crashes to the ground, taking, out, taking our outer wall and the sparrow's nest with it. As the brick and the cement hurtle down, I can hear Boritaswa figuring shatter into tiny pieces. Petrol fumes from the machines outside pour into the room together with the stench from broken sewer pipes. A heavy goods vehicle rumbles past in the distance. My mother roars like an angry tigress. This is my home, you fascists. If you come any nearer, I will jump. Go on, jump then, old lady. Then the bulldozer can scoop you up from the ground and take you away. It will save us a lot of trouble. The neighbor's voice was very f It's the drifter. I'm sure it's him. Mao Da mentioned he was working on construction sites now. I wonder why he still hasn't come back to Sichuan. Get back to your work. The sun is almost up. Don't waste your time pestering that mad woman. You two go and lean that flight of stairs against the front door so that she'll be able to climb down if she wants to. What does fascist mean? Are you stupid? Fashi means punish you with death. The drifter hasn't lost any of his Sichuan accent. A cold, dusty wind sweeps up the pile of receipts and medical records from the chest of drawers and blows all the calendars off the wall. I hear the pages rustle as they swirl through the air. Be careful, there is a strong wind. A voice shouts out from the ground floor. Don't stand by your door. There's no landing left. If you have some t something to say, climb down tomorrow and speak to the Hong Kong developer. I won't jump. My mother shouts to bulldozer headlamps. I want to live. Punish you with death, old lady. If you don't move out, none of us will get our annual bonuses. The covered balcony and the most of the outer, outer walls and windows of the rest of the flat have fallen down. All the flats to our left and right have been demolished, as have the stairwells and landing behind us. Our flat is now no more than a windy corridor. It's like a bird's nest hanging in a tree. I can feel it shaking in the wind. The translation is by Flora Drew. Sorry once again that the interpreters did not get the edited version of the story that was read. So, thank you. Uh, <coughs> 六四已经虽然过去二十年了，那么这个小说，我们可以把大家又带回到那个现场，它唯一的一个意义不是让我们看到血腥，它可以让我们从这种血腥里面其实是看到了我们的希望。嗯，这次就五十遍了。Uh, <coughs> Well, 20 years have passed since that event on the Tiananmen Square. I wrote the novel to uh, turn the clock back for the readers and to recall events that took place alongside the main massacre and also to explain what those events have, left to, have led to in China. Unfortunately, we're under time pressure. 
Uh, so all I can do is uh, say goodbye to you and thank you for coming. I hope that uh, you have been affected by what you've heard and that you're going to be interested in reading the entire novel. So thank you very much and goodbye. This flower is a gift for those that died during the massacre and events that followed.